Um, so, so I want to quickly start this application that we're actually trying to implement, for which we actually then used the technique that we invented. Um, afterwards, I want to go briefly into adaptive neural networks, as I'm assuming that everyone is familiar with them. Um, Temporary patients is our novel contribution, which I want to introduce, followed by the conclusion. Okay. Now for the application, so we are trying to build a radar-based people counting solution, and that's basically a system that um, uses a radar sensor that you are acquiring to estimate the number of people in a surveyed area or the occupancy level of the area, and we want to build an all-in-one solution. So not only a dumb sensor that just acquires the data, but it's actually the capability to understand the data, so it will not output um, the um, we're not output just the raw radar data, but instead just the estimate of or the estimated occupancy level of that area. And we want to build a self-contained solution. So we don't want any cloud computing to take place or to be necessary. No edge servers, basically, no connection to any external compute resources outside of these that are contained in the sensor itself. So the sensor consists of the radar sensor and in Cortex-M-based microcontroller. And um, I guess in this round, I don't have to go too much into the benefits of such a solution. So of course, you have the privacy advantage. When you are deploying such sensors in a private home, you don't really want to get the data into the cloud. Um, you are more flexible. You can deploy such solutions to environments without, um, without a network connection or any internet connection. Um, that makes it much easier to integrate such solutions into other devices. So these sensors will only be parts of uh, other products, basically. And um, these will create much more independent solutions. So you, for once, don't have the upkeep cost of a smaller bill um, due to not being relied on the cloud, a shorter bill of materials. You don't need any additional co-processors. And um, that has a lot of benefits for the end customer as well as the manufacturer that is integrating such sensor solutions. And the last benefit is the power efficiency. So you can build what we are calling virtual always on devices with your such sensors, which appear to be online for the user. So every time a user approaches the device, it's already powered up, but when no potential user is present, they can be powered down and that's achieved with such sensor solutions. And we built a naive implementation where basically the Radar data is um, acquired, pre-processed, and then processed by a neural network. And uh, deployment to the Cortex and microcontroller is relatively simple today, thanks to the established tool chains like TensorFlow, TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers and TVM. So we had, don't have much trouble in the deployment. We just had to use these tool chains. They also, we also did the typical optimizations like quantization. And we just had to make sure that the layer and architect layers and architectures that were used were a good fit for the microcontroller in terms of support and resource footprint. Um, however, um, we had a solution that worked. But we were not really satisfied with the latency or the delay of the processing and also the energy consumption of that solution. And now we had to look into ways to improve that situation. So with traditional optimizations, we came to a, basically to a stop. We could not further optimize without, without hurting the accuracy too much, and we needed to find alternatives. So we basically came across um, adaptive neural networks, and these are more or less an extension to traditional deep learning, which is uh, very static. So during the inference, you always execute one layer after its predecessor that will be followed by its successor until there are no layers left and you output the last result. And um, that is very beneficial for the compilation, of course. You can do a lot of tasks ahead of time, like the memory allocation and so on, or the memory planning. And um, it's also some, um, some kind of limitation, as um, every sample will be treated the same way by your model. So you can't react to changes in the environment anymore. 
everything will be just handled the same. And that just a limitation here. Uh, it's similar for the optimizations. These are applied ahead of time. So um, usually your optimizations, while being very beneficial for the efficiency, you always have some impact on the accuracy of your model, even if it's just very small. And they're also typically um, applied ahead of time. So they also cannot react to the changes during runtime anymore. And the observation, which is the basis for adaptive neural networks, is now that um, not all samples are created equally. You often have um, samples or data points that are very easy to correctly label with uh, relatively simple models, but also more difficult data points that need much larger and more expensive models. And adaptive neural networks or adaptive deep learning now makes um, the inference much more flexible. The models can change in structure and other hyperparameters at one time, and you can base this decision on the current circumstances. So either just on the input data or the input sample, information extracted from the input, or more information about the circumstances, like the available resources, and the time you know, the better we level, and so on. And there are a lot of different approaches on how to do adaptive neural networks. We were mostly interested in early exit neural networks, which were already mentioned in the keynotes this morning. And um, one of the reasons is that they are quite a nice fit for heterogeneous platforms and distributed platforms. And they look like this. And their party trick is basically that they can terminate the inference early um, by inserting these so called early exits into the architecture. So these are additional classifiers that are attached between the hidden layers of your model and um, structured and trained to perform the same task as the original output of your model. And that seems a bit counterintuitive that you are adding layers to reduce the footprint or reduce the overall latency. But the trick is that we are, if um, possible, we are just terminating the inference at one of these early exits here. And we don't have to execute the deeper layers, so we are skipping these computations. And um, the idea is that we are terminating on the early exits for the simple data points that I've mentioned previously and still have the full network capabilities and the prediction for the more difficult samples. So you can see it as a form of um, dynamic layer pruning. Yeah. <laughs> and um, the key problem with early executing networks is that you have to decide at runtime on when you want to terminate or if you can already terminate early. And um, for that decision, you don't have a lot of resources as it happens at runtime. You want to make a quick decision, a cheap decision, but you also want good decisions to be made. So these are two conflicting targets. And so it must, must be fast and cheap, but still good decisions to actually achieve any efficiency gains or performance gains without hurting the accuracy too much. And there are multiple state-of-the-art uh, solutions for the embedded use case uh, rule-based solutions are more practical. So here you apply a simple rule-based system where you incorporate, for example, the budget, so the available, especially in real-time systems, the available time window, that you will get a result uh, even if you don't have the time to execute the full network. Uh, in the keynote uh, this morning, there was uh, the confidence-based decision where you, are evaluating, where you are evaluating the early results. So we if you encounter an early exit, you will execute it, and then you check if the confidence of the result is high enough to terminate. So the assumption is that the high confidence somewhat correlates with a higher probability of a correct result. And then there are other solutions like uh, the patient-based solution, where basically you compare the outputs of the last number of classifiers, and if they agree, you terminate without having to execute the deeper layers but it requires deeper networks with more uh, early exits, which we usually don't have in the embedded use case. And um, uh, an, an alternative, which is not as important for us in the embedded use case, are the agent-based solutions. 
Then we have an additional network which guides this decision for your prediction network, but due to the overhead of using a second network, that's not really suitable for us. Yeah, that's mostly often trained by reinforcement learning. And um, for our use case, we had a number of observations. So our radar sensor pulls the data multiple times per second to have a quick reaction time, but our environment doesn't change as often. So depending on the use case, um, we are not really sure where our customers are going to use such sensors or for which applications. Um, we assume that if you want to build a smart home or a smart building and have, for example, a conference room, um, you have either a meeting or not. And these are periods of time from 30 minutes to hours um, with occupants and multiple hours like overnight and uh, holidays and weekends without any occupants. So the change rate of your environment is often much lower than the polling rate of your sensor. And for our naive approach, we would still pull the data multiple times per second, run the full inference, and that's kind of a waste, actually, in our opinion. So we wanted to find a solution to kind of detect if the environment changes or not and if the changes are relevant for our application. And yeah, the detection of the changes is actually not as simple as we thought. So originally we wanted to go with an input filtering approach, but finding a metric that works on these uh, raw radar data or the radar data, radar representation that we are operating with, that is able to extract the relevant information for our use case and is still cheap enough to run every time that's actually more, much more difficult than we expected. So we kind of failed with that approach. But as we previously looked into early experiment networks, we had the idea that we don't want to compare the inputs, but the outputs. And with early experiment networks, it's cheap to recover, cheaper to acquire this out, these outputs, as we don't have to run the full network. So we want to monitor the early exit results instead. And this has a number of benefits. So the first one is that we are now sharing operations between the inference and the input filtering. We are utilizing features that have been extracted by the hidden layers, which were trained for the task and data that we are using. And it's also somewhat independent from the task and data that we are using. So here we're using it for a classification task on radar data, but technically you could use it for all kinds of applications as long as you have a distance metric for your outputs. Um, now for the temporal equations, but at first I want to go with uh, difference detection, which was our first um, simple approach to that um, design. So we are, for that approach, we are only observing the change in the first early exit, always that early exit. And we are calculating the distance between that output. So it's a classification task, it's a vector space, and a reference output from a previous sample. And uh, of course, if the distance is below the threshold, we will just terminate. We don't execute the deeper layers, and we will go with the previously created result. Otherwise, we have to run the full inference and get a new result. Now, um, we don't use the direct predecessor as a reference, as we want to avoid um, to to have small accumulation or the accumulation of smaller changes that lead to a complete change in the environment without re-triggering the inference. So instead, we are going with what we're calling scenes and a scene detection algorithm. And the scene in our understanding now is a sequence of subsequent samples that are similar in our understanding. And the first sample of the scene will be the reference. And, um, so the subsequent samples are identified by having the distance below the threshold. And once we identify a sample with a larger distance, that will become the reference for the next scene. And, um, for the visualization, so the star in the middle is the reference sample and the uh, neighboring uh, stars, the smaller stars are basically the subsequent samples. And the radius is a threshold. And now if you have an, a new sample that is outside of the threshold, you have a new scene. And um, we implemented that, we tested that, 
And we figured out that it's uh, very sensitive to this threshold, which is a new hyperparameter that, we that we've introduced. And as we cannot really say where our customers are going to use such a, such a solution, we want to make it more robust so the customer doesn't have to tune these thresholds for the application. And we are calling that temporary patience. And we made two major changes to improve the accuracy and robustness of that solution. The first one is that we are now using different early exits as these distance classifiers. And we want to use an early exit that is actually capable of utilizing the features that are relevant for the current sample. So um, we can go with deeper classifiers, which are more expensive, but we're hoping to offset that with the increased accuracy. And um, we are selecting the classifier by going with the most shallow early exit that agrees with the inference uh, result of the um, reference sample. And the second change is to the new scene detection. So previously, we only relied on the distance threshold, which was um, kind of uh, unstable, especially in low confidence situations where your um, subsequent samples were very close, even if they belong to different classes. And therefore, we are also considering now the output level. So if the output level of, of your early exit changes, then you're also triggering a new scene. And we are hoping to increase uh, the accuracy in these ambiguous situations now. And that looks somewhat like this. So we still have these scenes with their threshold, but we can trigger new scenes with samples within the threshold if they change the label. And then we have some kind of overlap between these scenes. And um, we ran uh, an initial benchmark, or a first benchmark now, on a private radar data set. The recordings were rather short, between half a minute and two minutes, so the scenes within the recordings were even shorter, but that was the best data set we could collect in the time. So in the uh, smart home environment, you will have much lower environmental change rates. And we compared to the original single exit architecture that we based our early exit network on, as well as an exit-wise tuned confidence-based uh, decision mechanism on the same architecture. And you can see that the difference detection across the different uh, decision threshold, different decision thresholds that we've tested uh, drops off rather quickly, while the temporal patience is uh, more stable and comparable in accuracy to the confidence-based solution. However, on the uh, efficiency side, so we are, we've used the mean operations per inference, Yes, it's a universal metric, not hardware dependent. You can see that we uh, saved up to 26% of computations compared to the single exit version, and roughly 10% compared to the confidence-based solution. And we achieved that by being able to terminate much more often on these early exits. So even for the smallest decision threshold, we could terminate more than 80% of samples on the first early exit for the difference detection. And for the temporal patients, we distributed these um, a bit across the available early exits in the architecture. Now for the conclusion. So um, I already mentioned the 26% less operations. And these are very early results on the data set we had at hand, basically. Um, we are hoping to achieve even better results than real smart home or smart building recordings. And um, when the applications have more static content, the efficiency increase should rise as well. Um, we actually present us here today as we wanted to show that the temporal component of your input data cannot only be used to increase the accuracy of your models, as it has been previously done with RNNs and similar architectures. But for the embedded use cases, it might be better to go or look into methods to utilize that for a better efficiency. And we're hoping that um, there will be more solutions in the future that go in a similar way. And for our own future work, so we want to go into two directions. The first one is to utilize or test this method on different data modalities, as a lot of IoT and embedded applications usually handle somewhat um, correlated data, often sensor data streams, so not only radar data is temporarily correlated, 
but um, IoT, you have some microphones and you have smart speakers, for example, that are listening for the weight words. You have cameras for surveillance or production monitoring or more specialized sensors like the health sensors and your wearable devices. And on the other hand, we also want to make these adaptive deep learning methods more accessible. So currently it's a very niche topic. It's not very well known, but a lot of these approaches need quite some expert knowledge on how to implement them. And we want to make it more accessible by automating this process so um, that uh, data scientists can just data scientists can just submit their model, already trained model, and our system will then select the best approach on how to use adaptive deep learning to deploy it to embedded and distributed systems. Yeah, and um, that incorporates a number of steps that we need to implement, of course. Thank you. And, uh, Thank you, Max, for that great presentation. So I will open the sessions for, uh, for questions. You have a question. So you show a few numbers in terms of how often you can exit early. Yes. And I was wondering if you have also some numbers of benchmarks or statistics. Everything is that, but in terms of execution time of frame rate, so how, how much faster do we get? I mean, here you, you present the chair often, yeah. but. So we did most of the testing mm -hmm. not directly on the, for the adaptive neural networks, not on the microcontroller itself. We wanted to go with the more universal test first, also because the run times and the tool chains are not really capable of adaptive networks oh, okay. yet. So we would have to split up the models into all these okay. subsections. Mm -hmm. So I use some custom solution in one application that is able to live in the area exit. Yeah, um, okay. Infineon has these heterogeneous microcontrollers and for them we wouldn't have to go with custom solutions, we would just have to split up the model across the different processors. Mm -hmm. So we uh, also want to look into that and then we wouldn't have to go with custom solutions with the exception of the decision mechanism. And I think uh, what you said, so um, in terms of the mechanisms, so early exit, is this something that is not really, say, um, that there are any solutions for this right now? It's really no. some custom thing that you need to do in order to enable that. Do you see any, any standards coming there? Or? So these methods I've mentioned are somewhat well established in the research community, okay. but in industrial use case, I have not seen any, any standard implementation or any support on the major frameworks. This is a comment. So we, we have to extend Onyx to support that, and we have to extend Finn and the bird like the, the Italian school to be able to make that. Okay. Well, actually, this is what I wanted to know if Onyx has such a mechanism already. No, already it has some work. So. Okay. Okay. Yes. Another question, Elias? Yeah, maybe from more from an application perspective, you said yourself that the networks are quite small. And so it doesn't make sense to have an agent network that determines when to do the early exit, but still it doesn't come for free, right? Uh, so I'm just wondering, like, what kind of overhead you get due to having mechanisms in place? And yeah. Um, so for the confidence based solution, to just do a comparison of the largest element in your output vector, for our solution, we calculate the distance in the output vector space of the classification problem. So if you have 10 classes, these are 10 dimensional vectors. And compared to the experience, that's um, neglectable. Yeah. I think we have time for one more short question. Okay, then let's move on. So, thanks for the great talk.